and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Lion Wing Publishing, and the... the... The madman who were, who previously brought us picaresque Roman, a requiem for rogue for rogues. Why did I say Romes? And now bringing us Convictor Drive, armored by grief, the one and only Bradley Hailstorm. How are you doing today, man? I am good, sir. Thanks for having me back. I'm glad to be uh, chatting TTRPGs with you. And uh, as you can tell, we just can't get away from crazy subtitles in this company. So first. Uh, Picaresque Roman, a Requiem for Rogues, and now Convictor Drive, Armored by Grief. Uh, and it's the latter that I'm hoping to talk about today, and I'm excited to uh, have a conversation about it. Yep. So, Convictor Drive is a is a Common Rider inspired uh, ga game. And first first off, I have to ask: Were you before you took on this project? Were you familiar at all with Common Rider? Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, I've been familiar with Tokusatsu going back to the early '90s, but um, *Common Rider* wasn't always like my first go-to Tokusatsu Tokusatsu show. I was I was introduced to *Ultraman* in the early '90s um, through the Super Nintendo uh, because there was a there was a one-on-one -on -one fighting game on the Super Nintendo uh, that my brother just brought home one day, and uh, I was like, "What is this? What is this Ultraman thing?" And he was like, "I don't know. I just played it and I hate it, so you can play it." And uh, so I, I started liking Ultraman in the early '90s, and I didn't get into uh, Common Rider until much later uh, in life. Uh, I think I was uh, a sophomore in college, so it took me a while to discover Common Rider, um, and now I I like it a lot. But uh, you know, Ultraman's kind of like my genesis when it comes to uh, tokusatsu shows. And of course, having been born in the 80s and growing up in the 90s, I was huge into Power Rangers. And then when I got old enough, I sought out Super Sentai. So it's a, it's a genre that means something to me. And that's part of what I found appealing about Convictor Drive. Yeah. And to be, to be fair, up until, up until, up until the mid, up until the mid, up until the mid 2000s, when, when, um, so, when, when certain groups started to started to bring it stateside, your your pickings when it came to Common Rider were very very slim. You had you had the you had the um a, the attempt that Saban did that Saban did in adapting Black RX, which the less said about that the better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there and sometime sometime after after that you had the you had um you had Dragon Knight which Dragon Knight wasn't bad it was just screwed over by being put at the well over here in Minnesota the 11 the um 10:30 11 o'clock time slot on Saturday mornings which is death And that is not the uh, that is that, that is not the time slot you want if you're hoping to get beyond like one season of a show well I don't. I don't think. I don't think they ever even plan to do to do more than one to do more than one season. Especially since, well, you only had you only they only had one season's worth of footage with Ryuki and and the the TV special and the film. Not a whole lot to work with. They clearly were not very confident in what they had in what they in what they had if they were putting it in that time slot. That's for certain. Um. Uh, I think the people who are making it were confident in what they in what they were making. Oh, absolutely. It's just that that slot was meant was managed by four kids at, or 4K media the as they call themselves these days to stay ahead of the tax man. But <laughs> they were not known for making smart decisions. They were they were the people responsible for that really bad dub of Tiga. It's unfortunate. Uh, but we're we are in. But I'd like to think that with the with the um with the international launch of stuff of stuff like Futo Tante, we are in better times now. I'd like to think we are too. Mm -hmm. I certainly hope we are. I mean, 
Oh. That, e that end... There hasn't really been a bad entry in the Reiwa era for Common Rider. I mean, we, I mean may, maybe one could argue Sab Saber isn't as good as some of the others, but that's up for debate. And well, it's too it's too early to say too much on Ge to say too much on Geats, but. Would it be fair of me to say that Convictor Drive has more in common with more tech-based writers, or, or in some cases, a lot of the, a lot of the stylings more of the Showa era? Yeah, so I, I would say that's accurate. I would also say, though, that Convictor Drive isn't only inspired by Common Rider. There's a lot of different stuff in in Convictor Drive. When I was talking with Seagrace on early in the process about possibly localizing this, I asked him, like, where did your inspirations came from? come from? And, of course, he said Common Rider. But there's a lot of Ultraman in there as well. But then there's a lot of superhero stuff. Um, in fact, there's probably more superhero stuff in Convictor Drive than a lot of people would would initially think. I mean, we have uh, been leaning more into the to the common writer stuff, the more Tokusatsu stuff, because that's kind of the core of the inspiration. But then, you know, there's a lot of Iron Man. There's a lot of uh, My Hero Academia in Convictor Drive as well. And and Sigure san was very quick to point that out. Like, hold on, like, yeah, Tokusatsu. Yes, that's totally in here. That's my main inspiration. But I'm really big into superheroes, and I'm really big into Iron Man specifically. And I wanted the game that also brought in elements of that as well. So it really is kind of a combination of uh, of influences kind of converging into into one piece. And I think you take all of those inspirations, and then you also just take the the creativity of C. Grayson and how his mind works, and you get something really special. That's there are many reasons why I chose Convictor Drive as our next TTRPG localization project, but certainly, you know, how all of those things came together to create a very unique experience was at the top of my list of things that that I said to myself, like, okay, yeah, this is this is why I want to wor work with this game next. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I found kind of it kind of interesting, just fr from what I was able to see, is its core mechanic is a D is a D10 die pool. Which is not you a, D, a Japanese TTRPG not using D sixes is something of an uncommon thing. I would say it's so uncommon to the point of almost being weird. Uh, I mean, that's how synonymous you know D sixes are with Japanese role playing games. Uh, very rarely do you see a system that uses anything other than D sixes. Also, part of the thing, you know, part of the reason that I was drawn to this game is because it did it breaks the mold in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe all designers or all publishers or PR people say this about the game that they're primarily focusing on, but I really feel it's authentically true for Convictor Drive. Like there's stuff in Convictor Drive that you are likely not going to see in any other game. Mm -hmm. um, which is very neat uh, and hard to do in a very crowded, popular genre right now. It's hard to stand out, and it's hard to do something that people haven't already done before. And certainly there's elements in Convictor Drive that have been done before, and those elements that have been done before that are in Convictor Drive are tried and true mechanics, and they're there because we know that they work, and people do expect some level of familiarity with RPGs. But then there's all this other stuff, including the lore, the you know the narrative premise that, and the some of the combat mechanics that you're not going to see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, the D10 system I think is uh, is is really interesting. And I asked Seager, I sound like, well, you know, why did you choose a D10 system? Because none of Group SGR's other games are a D10 system; they're all D6s. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why did you choose D10 this time? And he was like, well. Um, I split up the workload this time because most of the time Secret Son de designs, you know, the uh, the game mechanics and the systems, and also is in charge of the world building and all the lore. But this time he uh, he brought in a partner who had who's done a lot of like Cthulhu writing in Japan um, for the for the RPG scene, and uh, so he brought in this writer and said, "I just want you to focus on the lore, so that way I can dive deep into the mechanics because I want to do something different. I want to challenge myself." 
um, and kind of push myself outside my comfort zone. And the D10 system was one of his first ways of uh, challenging himself to do something that kind of goes against what he naturally would do. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes with with that in mind, uh, it definitely it seems that a lot of it, it seems that lore wise, a lot of it is taking place in in what's referred to as the Yokohama zone. Um, is is that is that where he is that where he's from? Is that why he chose Yokohama as the focus, or was there a different reason he chose that particular area? There wasn't uh, there wasn't a real reason why he chose Yokohama as his as his main narrative backdrop for the game, um, other than he likes Yokohama. <laughs> um, so I get I, you know you, you don't question the man. I'm just like okay yeah y- yes sir that that works for me that's a good enough answer and well, he didn't elaborate and I didn't ask any further questions. Well, in all in all fairness, much in this much in the same way I've seen people say that. Um, that New York City is oh, is overused in f- in fiction here in the states. I could easily see someone saying that Tokyo is overused <laughs> in fiction. Period. Over in Japan. Yeah, I mean, so there's that, and also, yeah, I don't know. I I would imagine that, and not that um, Sigurdsson lives in Tokyo, but. You know, when you live in New York, when you're writing a story, you probably don't really want to set it in New York because you're like, I know this place. It's pretty boring. <laughs> like, um, I want to do something different. And I think that was, I think that's the case with with a lot of uh, Japanese designers as well, is because Tokyo is so um, overrepresented, uh, not really by the Japanese, but <laughs> by those outside of Japan. Um, they they really kind of laser focus in on Tokyo, and there's a, a real fixation with that with that city. And so I, I think naturally we w- we would never have gotten this game set in Tokyo. Uh, and now you know, knowing the lore um, as as much as I do, in my mind I'm like this game, this world could take place in no other city other than Yokohama. So uh, once w- once I kind of realized that because I am the book's editor, I was like, you know what? Okay, like I'm 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 glad he chose Yokohama because I couldn't picture this happening in any other city. Mm-hmm. And speaking speaking of the the uh, mechanics end of th- of things, when it comes to when it comes to char- when it comes to um, character creation and the creation of of um, of their of their particular drive, one would it be fair of me to say that e- even though there isn't a- even that. It the what I see is fairly freeform, but there are um, a set of archetypes to build around. Yeah, so there are there there are four archetypes. There's like four quote unquote classes, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but within those classes, you've got customization options. So let me preface this by saying the the main draw of the game is you're wearing these armored suits called convictor suits. Mm-hmm. And they can kind of be thought of as like Iron Man type suits, but in my mind, I kind of also just think of them as like um, like mechs almost. And why that matters for customization is because much like you would outfit a mech with different parts, you can do that for your character, for your convictor suit itself. So you can, in the book, you've got a list of options for your head parts, your torso parts, your leg parts, your arm parts, and then for your weapons. And so... Yeah, there are four main uh, classes in the game, but each of those classes kind of plays a little differently depending on how you kit out uh, your specific convictor. And the the thing that I really like about Seagray's work, and you could probably expand this out to a lot of just Japanese RPGs in general, is they really try to limit um, barriers to entry. Like throughout Convictor Drive, I remember when I was like reading through it all for the first time and I kind of got to the end and I, and I said to myself, like, this is a game that doesn't want to get in its own way. This is a game that doesn't want to be its own barrier to entry. And you can see that in, in the character customization, character building part. Um, because yes, you're given head parts, arm parts, torso parts, leg parts, and weapons to choose from. You've got options, Mm. but in the book, they're not giving you a ton of options. You're not going to get into this place where you flip to like the weapon section for your runner type convictor suit and then, you know, slip into the state of analysis paralysis because you have too many choices in front of you. It's like, yeah, there are choices here. You've got, you know, you got eight choices. 
Um, so, so there's enough depth there to kind of tailor your experience to whatever character that you want to build and play, but there's not so many options to where you can't just get into the game. I mean, RPGs are my are my format of choice when it comes to tabletop gaming, but sometimes, you know, I, I crack open a new book and I'm like, this thing is a tome. I don't want to do this. I'm not in the, I'm not in the headspace to do this right now. Mm -hmm. Convictor is not that, you know, it's a good length book and there's lots of details in there. Uh, but I don't think anyone will ever get stuck on the details. Um, and I think it allows you to then facilitate quicker sessions and getting you right into the action and the, and the storytelling aspect of things. And that's kind of Seagray's big thing. This is one of probably Seagray's, one of his crunchier games. And this is pretty light crunch, all things considered. So he really thinks about accessibility and how to get people just into the fun as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, um, I'd like you to give me the skinny on the on the um, convictor types. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. So there are four convictor types in the game, and they each kind of serve a different role, as you would imagine. You know, like any class, mm -hmm. um, you've got your runner types, which are highly agile, who uh, are really good for. Uh, maneuverability, especially vertical maneuverability, uh, verticality um, and vertical orientation is a big part of the combat, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. So that's your runner type. Um, you've got your shooter types, which focus on long range um, weaponry, sniper rifles and, and the like. So they can sit back on top of a building and kind of pick off targets and snipe targets. Um, you've got your strength types, which are your tanks. They're in there and they want to they want to exchange fisticuffs. Um, they want to protect the team as much as possible. And then you've got kind of like your all-rounder, which are called adept types. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, each of those types can be kind of built out in different ways. You could have a, uh, a runner type that's a little tanky. You could have a tank that's also pretty proficient in long-range uh, combat. Now, that might not be the most effective use of a strength type, but you could build that if you wanted it to. You could have a sniper who can get in, get out real quick, take pot shots from far away, get in there real quick, do a little bit of damage up close, and then uh, get out on pretty unscathed, if not completely unscathed. So there, there are definitely ways to kind of like get in there and tinker around with tinker around with each build, and you're not really locked into anything. You know, you're not like hard locked into playing a certain way just because you choose a runner type. Doesn't mean you have to be the quintessential durability type of character that you know is just the only thing that they have that's in their tool belt that's useful is their fat. Mm -hmm. Now, when it one of the, since you mentioned it, let's get into that because vertica verticality and even anything air based is something not a lot of RPGs try try and tackle try and try and add that extra degree of freedom. If you don't mind me reference making an engineer reference, yeah, so. This is part of why Sigrason wanted to just focus on the mechanics of the game and let someone else be concerned about the lore. Because he did want to create a game that was pretty unique and new and does things that other games do not. So combat in Convictor Drive takes place on a 3x3 three three grid. The first row of that 3x3 three three grid is your ground area. It is where your combat's going to take place when you are on the ground. Go figure, right? The row right above that is called your midair area. And this is, um, you know, when when players jump into the air or they're on top of like a small building rooftop or they're fighting, um, you know, a couple feet off the ground, that's where that action is going to take place. And then your, your top row is called your high sky area. And this is going to be for uh, folks who are perched atop super, super tall buildings or radio towers. It's for um, the area where someone who has a convictor suit that can fly that's going to happen in the sky high area um and uh it's where for instance shooter types are going to want to spend a lot of their time because there are some bonuses that you do get for uh being in certain areas uh mm -hmm. in relation to where your target is and so although someone might look at the combat grid and convictor drive and say well how how much tactical depth can there really be with basically nine squares to move your characters around in but the thing that is so magical and and just so impressive for me uh, about Sigurdsson is he takes nine squares and makes it feel like it's about 90 and yet doesn't do so in a way where you feel like you actually have to grapple with 90 squares he gets so much economy out of those nine spaces 
um, that, yeah, at quick glance, you're like, hey, that looks like it probably doesn't have a lot of depth to it. But it's deceiving. You get in there and how each of those squares interact with one another because each of those squares has an interaction with one another. Even if you're on opposite sides of the board, your, your square is still going to have some kind of um, interface penalty, uh, bonus, or, or some kind of special effect. Um, and so <clears throat> it's really cool, especially when you get in there with three or four people and you're fighting these, you know, these big bad guys. How you how maneuverability and how verticality really come into the strategic part of how you're supposed to take down you know some kind of some kind of target. Mm -hmm. Now taking that now taking that into uh, into account, um, what I did I did notice the um, skill level set setup that you that is in that is in the book. I wasn't able to see a full size version of the character sheet. So take so mm -hmm. take this take this with a particular grain of salt, but would it be fair of me to say that the attribute skill relationship that you see in a lot you see in a lot of games, especially games that use a dice pool, isn't here. It's primarily skill based. I yeah, I would say that's I'd say that's accurate. Mm -hmm. Oh. And the other th the other thing that I that I was cu I was curious about is and this is this is one of the big things that's br that's brought up is the phase design of an adventure the phases of a particular yeah. adventure or even even episode if you want if you want to go that route since one since a lot of these kind of games can set themselves up kind of like a kind of like the episode of a TV series yeah and i think um, I think this game probably lends itself more to an episodic kind of quicker type of session than your average, especially like your average mainstream Western RPG. So I think it's probably good to think about a session of Convictor as a 22 minute episode of some kind of anime, honestly. But yeah, so, um, so... Each session sort of is set up in the same way. You've got your your opening phase, your investigation phase, your climax phase, your ending phase, that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The main phases that you're going to be spending the bulk of your time in are though uh, the investigation phase and the climax phase. So the investigation phase, the whole goal of of you know the the PCs is to piece together kind of uh, fragmentary information in an effort to get a full picture of what they're up against. So um, usually how a session starts in Convictor is, you know, you're going to start with um, investigating maybe like a common, I don't know, a common disturbance, a common disturbance, a common, uh, a common crime. It's not going to be like this big grand thing where you're where you jump right into like, ah, this is the big bad guy of the session, and now we get to the final showdown. No, you've got to piece together what's happening. Um, initially, you're going to piece together what's happening with these more common common crimes, that kind of thing. And this is going to take place every, uh, through using what are called investigation cards. Um, but as you go through the investigation phase and you, you utilize these investigation cards and you um, are able to clear like the uh, the objective condition of that specific investigation card, you begin to piece together the larger plot that's taking place. And the larger plot that's taking place is, um, you know, all, there's usually always some bigger villain behind the initial villain, right? So once you kind of piece together exactly what's happening and what the true scheme is, once you've kind of laid bare what the actual scheme is, that's when you move to the climax phase, which is primarily the combat phase in Convictor Drive. And that's where you're facing off, yeah, against the big baddie in, uh, in that, uh, and on that combat grid, that three by three combat grid that I talked about. So during that investigation phase, you've got more, yeah, you've got investigation cards, but it's more theater of the mind stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once you get to that combat phase, it's like, okay, yeah, no, now we're going act we're going tactile with our combat. We're getting in there. We're going to use a board. So it, I don't know if you remember when we talked about Picaresque Roman last, like Picaresque I, Roman. It, yeah, Picaresque Roman's like all theater of the mind. There's no mm -hmm. board to move anyone around on ever. Um, Sigre San said, okay, I want to keep some of that in Convictor Drive because that's just naturally like that's the type of 
game that he likes to play. So of course you're going to see that in his in his design manual. But with Convictor, he did want to challenge himself to say, okay, I want that theater of the mind element of Convictor Drive, but I also want something a little bit more traditional with actual pieces that you're going to move around and they're going to interact with one another. And that's where you get the climax phase. So you always have an investigation phase in Convictor Drive and you always have a climax phase. You never just have one. Mm-hmm. Now, I did find the investigator card to be an, to be an interesting concept. I'd like to go a little bit into into that since yeah. obviously with investiga- investigation a lot a lot of games tr- a lot of games treat that as just a series of skill rules and that and that's it. With something like this, we're giving a bit more attention to it. Yeah, I mean certainly there are there are some skill rules involved, uh, but I do think that it takes it one step further and because it is one of only two big phases in the game um you spend more time in the investigation phase here than you would in uh an investigation phase equivalent of another game and so you do have these things called investigation cards and on the investigation cards you usually have like um your main objective Mm -hmm. you've got your um your reveal condition You've got your overview of kind of like what's happening. Um, and then you've got some favored skills, you know, skills that are going to be specifically helpful to be able to um, get what you need from this investigation card so that you can reveal the big scheme that's happening behind the initial, you know, uh, petty crime or whatever the case may be. And so um, y- you do get a little bit of like a some card gamey elements in the investigation phase just because of how the investigation cards are handled. You know, you've got your investigation cards, they're placed face down. Um, After that specific investigation cards reveal conditions have been met, the cards flipped face up. Um, So, and that's kind of like when the, that's when the players know, ah, okay, so here's what's going on. Here's what we have to do. Here's, here's our objective now. Um, So there's, there's a good bit of role-playing early on in the investigation phase just to be able to meet the criteria to even reveal the investigation card um, that's at play. But then once that card is revealed, that's when that's when skill checks come into play. Um, and then from that, once you kind of gather together the various pieces of, of data and information that lead to what's actually happening in this particular session with kind of the larger scheme, um, and once you've kind of pieced together your clues um uh, either by luck or you know by skill um you you take these investigation cards and they become intel cards and um intel cards are there to uncover um you know a mul- uh, all sorts of things and so without getting to getting into all the specifics i think you know people from what i've seen like in our discord and what what are what people are talking about a lot of people are talking about the climax phase because it is it's combat heavy and people want to engage in combat in a tokusatsu like RPG. But it really is that's really only like half of the experience. The other half is like this heavy role playing element where you're just trying to figure out how to even get to the combat phase. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, depending on the GM and how you want to do things, sometimes players may they may fail to get to to the to the climax phase um, of the game and then you know, uh, it'll be up to the to the GM to figure out how they're going to move forward after doing that. So, so there's an element of danger there. There's an element of uncertainty in the investigation phase. Um, there's a lot of teamwork that's required. Um, there's a lot of maybe just stumbling upon things by luck, but then also just figuring out how you're going to leverage your party's skills to try to uncover the clues that you need to uncover to get to that climax phase, so that you can take down that big baddie who is threatening the Yokohama zone. Mm-hmm. And speaking speaking of that. Because of the fact that baddies can take can take multiple multiple forms and multiple ta- and multiple um, takes in the um obviously there's going to be a best a bestiary but are there going to be options to customize a a entry within entry within that to so that you don't have to try and account for every single possibility? Yeah, there is. I mean. There's definitely room for customization. There, there is a there is a bestiary, which is which is nice. That obviously that wasn't something we had with Picaresque Roman because you couldn't quite do that there. Um, but there is one here. But there's also the ability to to tweak that. 
Um, and, and the book does talk a little bit about how to tweak those things so that GMs aren't left kind of in the dark on that, which is nice. Um, yet another, j just another nice way of holding folks' as hands so that they don't feel overwhelmed, so they can just like enjoy the game, um, which is yet again something that I really admired about this game because so many times I'll get, a, I'll get a new book and I'm like, ugh. I don't think I want to do this. Like, um, you know, I've I've got to learn too much right now, and I'm not in the in the right mindset to do that. And that's not really this game. It really does look for ways to to ease you into things, and really just get it wants to get you into the action and having fun quickly. And and one of the ways is to do that is allowing you to here here are your enemies that you can choose from. You can use these, you know, right out of the book. Like these are stock values. You don't have to change anything if you don't want. And also, here's how you can customize it for very specific scenarios. And here's how you should do that. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, uh, one thing one thing that I was a bit curious about when I looked at the uh, cl the climax phase is the reserves tracker. Mm -hmm. uh, Especially, especially given how it's set, it's saddled along alongside enemy initiative. How how is that going to work out? Yeah, so I mean, reserves are, um, <clears throat> they're ultimately the 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 resource that determines when a character is going to act in the order of the rest of who's involved in the in the climax phase and so the higher the reserves the sooner your character is going to act and so um that is it there's some interplay between that along with uh enemy initiative that i think is kind of handled in interesting ways um because you can also think of reserves as almost being um like uh skill points and so, you know, each time that you have to do, uh, you have to, or each time you have to engage in certain actions, you've got to spend reserves to do so. And so, you know, that begins to change uh, where in the turn order you fall. Um, so you constantly have to look at, okay, here's the an enemy's initiative, which is pretty static, right? It doesn't really change. So the only thing that changes in that turn order is the players and how many reserves they have left. But you get into this mind game of like, okay, I need to take this action. I need to do this thing. But if I do that, that's going to deplete my reserves, which means I'm going to act later in the turn order on the next turn, which if I do that, that gives the enemy a chance to attack here and here or me. And I don't have enough HP to survive the next attack, but I have to engage in this action that uses these reserves now. So it gets into this, um, you know, you've got a lot of uh, decision points just based on this reserve versus initiative system, which creates a certain dynamic element to combat that, yeah, uh, other, other games have accomplished this too but how it how it's accomplished in convictor drive in addition to everything else that you're having to keep track of in the climax phase in convictor drive uh creates a, a pretty dynamic combat situation that feels very fluid um and that feels like it can it can turn on a dime which feels very much so like a tokusatsu show that just the smallest thing goes wrong and the tide of battle has shifted and so sigre-san really wanted uh not to he didn't want players feeling as if they had to make these agonizing decisions because again he doesn't he doesn't want to like encourage slowing down the flow the session flow and at the same time he wants you to be intentional with what you're choosing to do in combat um so that your choices matter mm -hmm. which which is a good a good thing because when you were describing that setup the question that that was in the back of my mind was whether was whether or not um the rainy day paradox could end up occurring. Oh. The rainy day paradox, also, which is al also known in this temple as the ninety nine mega elixirs, is somebody holding something off for, for quote unquote when they need it. <laughs> even if even if the when they need it never comes. Hence the ninety nine mega elixirs, because there's always been that guy who's said. I can't use one of my mega elixirs. What if I need it while they're fighting against the final boss of the campaign? <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't think I don't think you really get into that much um, with the combat in Convictor Drive. 
there, there's not a lot of room to stall, honestly. Um, because each turn that you choose to s just sit on your hands um, is a turn that you are leaving your teammates in peril or it's just giving the, the enemy an opportunity to pummel you. So there's not a lot of like incentive just to sit on something for a long time. Um, and, and and I think it was, I, I didn't ask him about this, but you know, reading through the book and editing the book, it seems pretty clear that there was this intentional design choice to ensure that each turn players are doing something. Each turn, they're not just waiting to see how the enemy is going to act so that they can then respond to that. It doesn't really encourage that kind of interaction um, in combat. So I'm not sure you would get in. I'm not sure the that that idea, that concept, the rainy day concept, super applies to the combat here, which is which is a good thing based on the, you know these sessions are supposed to be um, they're supposed to be not short. You, you know, you're not going to get in in and out of a convictor drive session in 30 minutes or something but you might do it in an hour you might do it in two hours you might wrap up an entire story arc in two to three hours mm -hmm. um but if you think about that in the larger scheme of how long it takes to play any other game that's pretty short all things considered to be able to tell a complete story yeah that being said this game is not it's it's not just designed for one shots picaresque roman was a one shot game yeah you could totally string it together into a campaign type of uh, situation but even in the book picaresque roman says like well, this is like a one shot game and a lot of japanese role playing games are designed around one shots mm -hmm. this absolutely you can you can do this as a one shot totally um it's set up to be to allow that but it even says in the book that no this game is also designed for campaign play and you can very much so uh with little modification create a much longer adventure here than you can in a lot of other japanese rpgs um but even still the game doesn't want you to get tripped up with with combat it doesn't want you just sitting back to figure out how you're going to respond yeah maybe you might do that occasionally but doing that too often is you're you're going to get penalized for it just based on how the combat rules are set up yeah now on the Kickstarter page, you talk you talk about um, new new art, fresh fresh layouts, some additional mm -hmm. content, the and a longer book length. With that in mind, would would it be fair of me to say that this is a bit akin to a director's cut in terms of what's being added and refined? Totally, very. That's a very good way to think about it. In fact, you can probably think about all of our TTRPGs going forward as being sort of a game of the year edition. Um, or, or or a director's cut. The thing that I like to do, like, when I'm looking at a game, I immediately I'm I'm sometimes I will check out a game based on art alone, mm. and sometimes I'll never check out a game because I don't like its cover art. Now, uh, call me sha call me a shallow player. Call me a <laughs> uh, call that bad business practices. I'm sure I'm missing out on wonderful games just because I didn't like the cover art. But it's how I operate. And so art's really important to me. When I break open a book, I want the art to be clean. I want it to be evocative. I want it to, um, I want it to fit the setting and the theme of the game, but I also want it to look like all the other art in the book. Mm -hmm. Something you'll find a lot in, in RPGs in general, but especially in the Dojin Japanese RPG scene, is uh, for their art, they'll either use royalty-free art um, or they'll use art from 12 different artists throughout the book. Now, some people like that. They like that eclectic approach and just having diverse art styles in different parts of the book. I hate it. I hate it. Um, and I'm choosing for a unified voice. Yes. Yes. I mean, I really do mean the word. I hate it. Um, I like standardization of art. And so the first thing that I did with Picaresque Roman, and again for Convictor Drive, because Sigre-san does not uh, view art in the same way that I do, is I said to him, like, hey, um, let's work together on Convictor Drive, but is it okay if I redo all the art in the book? And he said, of course. Um, so we'll never, we'll never make a decision without consulting the the designers first. Uh, so that's the first thing I did for Convictor for Convictor Drive. I commissioned all new art. So all the art that's in the English version is not featured in the Japanese version, other than the Adept model. The Adept model huh, has made it uh, into the Japanese release and will make it into the English release because it's that good. That was done by the main the main illustrator, Temi, who's a manga artist. And in fact, I commissioned all of the rest of the book's art uh, 
from Timmy. So um, it's all of Timmy's artwork throughout the book, mm -hmm. which is uh, fantastic. So new art in the game. Uh, we totally redid the layout. We did the same thing with Picaresque Roman. We'll probably do the same thing from with most of our RPGs that we've got planned for 2023 and 2024. Um, just because, you know, when you're... When you're localizing an RPG for a new market, you really need to be able to present a, a product in a way that makes sense to the new market. And uh, and sometimes graphical layouts for a Japanese book are not going to make any sense for a Western release. Um, sometimes they will, but sometimes they won't. And they didn't here either. Not to mention when you're working with doujin releases, I mean, you're talking about you know independent designers and publishers working on a budget oftentimes a shoestring budget right so it's not like they even have the the fiduciary resources to be able to you know put together this this really fantastic um you know graphical layout style user interface whatever word you want to use there but that is something that we do offer um you know, our, our, our partners is like, hey, we can take this book and we can put some money behind it. And one of the ways that we put money behind it is let's make sure that our graphical design elements are on point. And so we redid all of the layouts. And then, um, yeah, we're, at, we're adding new content uh, through the Kickstarter, through Stretch Goals. Uh, th that, uh, and this is content that was not available in the original Japanese uh, release. And the, the original Japanese release was soft cover only. And of course, we only do hardcover books. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> what are you shooting for as far as the page count? We are at... Oh, I got it pulled up here. No, oh, no, I don't. I only have the sample pulled up. Give me a second. This might be some dead air. I apologize. <laughs> <Where> <laughs> Thanks for I... great audio, right? No one talking. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, now this will be for the standard edition and of course this is like subject to change based on things we add to or things we decide hey eh, you know what that probably doesn't need to be in there um although most of our editing passes are are complete at this point now we're just kind of like touching things up <clears throat> um and doing some proofing but right now for the standard edition because the game does come in two editions we're at 153 or uh, 155 pages. Um, and then the deluxe edition, which we're calling the armored edition, uh, is going to clock in higher than that because we, like we did for Picaresque Roman, we are including uh, some of our translation notes in the back of the book, just talking about our process and the, and the decisions we made or didn't make uh, with, with, with uh, enhancing the book. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can certainly get behind that. And I know that the. I do want to congratulate you on managing to smash through the initial goal that you had, since at the time of this recording, you're just shy of 33,000. Yeah, I appreciate it. No, um, so this was cool. A little story. Um, so w this is our seventh Kickstarter? Yeah, seventh. Um, and they've all, they've all been successful. They've all funded. And they've all funded well beyond their funding goal. And we've had some that have funded in three hours, which was, I think that was our fastest funded project. That was back in 2020. Um, this project funded in one hour and 38 minutes. So it's um, beat our, uh, our second fastest, now our second fastest uh, funded project by quite a lot. Um, so... When when you know when I go into Kickstarter's, I kind of have an idea in mind based on market research, but also just doing this for four years now. I kind of I kind of think I know mostly what's going to happen in, in like the opening of a, of a campaign. Um, where it gets harder to predict is in that middle part. You never know what's going to happen there. Um, but this exceeded my expectations. Uh, I certainly expected us to fund, of course. Um, I did not expect us to be sitting at almost. Uh, I think it was like twenty nine thousand. Uh, on day on day two and a half or going in right into day three we've never done that before now so part of me was like wow that's super awesome um i'm glad people see the value in this in this game i'm glad people are stoked so part of me was super surprised part of me wasn't surprised um because of how many pre-launch signups we had so we did something different that we hadn't done in any of our previous campaigns normally when we run like a, a pre-campaign or a pre-kickstarter ad campaign 
we use the Kickstarter lander page in our marketing ads. So that way, when let's say you're on Facebook, you see our ad for Convicted Drive, you click the thing, it takes you to the Kickstarter landing page. All you got to do is click a button. You know, that button, that green button that says notify me when the, when the project launches. Real easy. Everyone can do it. A lot of people are not adverse to doing that. It takes a second. This time we were doing something different. We took someone to a backer kit landing page that talked about the game, had graphics, gave some of the key points, but you had to put in your email address to get notified when the campaign went live. Now, you wouldn't think like, okay, it takes 10 seconds to, to type out your, your email address, if that, and click submit. You wouldn't think that that would, that that would be a huge barrier for folks, but it is. Like People are willing to click a button. A lot of people are not willing to spend the extra 10 seconds to write in their email. So in the in the ad campaign leading up to the Kickstarter launch, I was like, you know, we're going to try this because I, at some point I have to see if, if this is a viable option for us um, because it, it does allow you to build a, a list. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I had to mute my mic because also what's bad for audio is someone coughing into the mic. I apologize. I'm a little sick. It's probably why I sound congested. Anyway, so I needed to try this and I tried it with Convictor Drive. And we had like 1,500 signups before we went live. And we only advertised for like three weeks. So I kind of knew like, oh, I think people are kind of into this. I just didn't expect to to fund that quickly. That was really awesome. Yeah. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops. Um, especially especially since I'm, I, always ha I always have ideas for just about everything I cover. <laughs> but... With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, Mildred, I appreciate the time. I had a great conversation with you last year when we did this for Picaresque Roman, when you reached out to me on Discord. Uh, it took me a few days to get back to you because it was right around launch time, so I apologize. But I knew I wanted to do it even before I responded back to you because mm -hmm. that first conversation was so good. Thank you again for the conversation today. Um, always good questions. And I hope to be able to come back on and talk about our next TTRPG because we have pivoted. We used to be... Uh, kind of a general tabletop games company where we published, localized and published anything, card games, board games, RPGs. Um, going forward for 2023 and 2024, we're really only focusing on on role playing games. Uh, we might have uh, we might have one more, one or two more board games up our sleeve uh, in the coming years, uh, but we're primarily just focused on localizing Japanese uh, tabletop mm -hmm. role playing games. Yep, and. Of course, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.